How's everybody this morning? Are you expecting a lot? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm going to do everything I can to pack into the time we have together the most things that you can take with you and apply them right away. Fair enough? You know, I was thinking this morning, the very best thing about mega success that I've been privileged to experience is you reach a point where you can live anywhere, operate your business from anywhere, and just do what you want to do with your time where you're totally free. Now, a lot of people, including some of my friends, wonder why I continue to do seminars because I've done hundreds of seminars and people wonder why am I doing seminars because I could be on a Caribbean island somewhere drinking pina coladas and believe me I like pina coladas <laughs> and I could be playing tennis which is my favorite hobby I play tennis at a veterans level tournament level and I could be doing a lot of other things that I enjoy doing, like traveling. But I was thinking this morning, you know, the place I want to be the most today is right here with you. Thank you. And the reason for that is because the unsung heroes of the world and my heroes are entrepreneurs like you. And so I serve, thank you. Entrepreneurs are vilified in books on TV and they are the real creators of wealth, the creators of jobs, the creators of innovation. People like you starting, you know, I started with $90. I'm gonna show you the, and I started my information marketing empire with $90, and I'm gonna show you that ad that I started with and built from there and have sold, can you believe it, over $4 billion worth of products and services in my own companies and in client companies. And I've written every word of copy that made all that success possible, and I'm gonna share with you the key principles, all that I can pack in of what is involved and making that happen. Would that help you? Yes. I, can tell you <laughs> I can tell you this, no matter what you're doing online, offline, whether you're a information marketer or a retailer or a plumber or whatever it is, that business that you're involved with, your ability to communicate your sales message in print, whether it's on the internet, whether it's in magazines or newspapers or on TV or radio, that ability is the highest paid ability in the world. I was thinking, you know, I may be the highest paid writer in the world in, the, in, in this sense. Some authors can work two years and have a best-selling book and they can earn a million dollars. Very few do but they can do, they can do it, the, the ones at the top do it. But you know, I can work two weeks and create an ad, which I've done many times, with about 1,200 words, and that 1,200 word ad many times has exceeded $20 million in sales. Now, as a copywriter, when I put my copywriter's hat on for clients, I normally work on a 5% royalty. And a 5% of $20 million is how much money? It's $1 million in my bank account. Is that worth spending two weeks? Of course, it's two weeks and all the years of experience, the trial and error. See, what I'm gonna teach you today, as we get into the material, is not some theory. It's what I got my teeth kicked in learning and because there weren't any seminars like this to go to when I started 
I had to learn the hard way, and the hard way is tough because you don't know what to do and you make all the mistakes. So I'm gonna teach you many of the principles of what you need to do to succeed. Most of you are interested in online marketing, fine. That's a very good, arguably the best marketing medium ever developed. And I'm gonna show you what you need to do to succeed online with copy because no matter what you do, you're gonna to need to have great copy. Either you can hire a great copywriter or you can do it yourself. Now, a lot of people want me to write copy for them. I only take on a few clients here and there. I recommend to most of my clients, come to my seminar and I'll teach you how to write copy because there's one thing you will have the advantage of even over most copywriters, and that is the passion that you have for your product and service. Some copywriters can generate that passion, the world-class ones, and there are only probably less than 100 in the whole world that can do that kind of work that you need. So you have your choice of either learning yourself. I believe that if you learn yourself, learn how to do this, and, and copywriting is a learned skill. No one's a born copywriter, contrary to popular belief because people have attended my copywriting boot camps and I've seen people that have never written a word of copy, chiropractors, medical doctors, engineers, and have learned how to write powerful, successful copy that has earned them, in some cases, millions and millions of dollars. And you can do that too. Uh, before I got into more depth, I wanted to acknowledge a few things, you know? I think Mal Emery has put together a tremendous program here. And he told me this morning that today he was cutting a check for between 60 and 70,000 Australian dollars to benefit cancer research, ovarian cancer research. Is that fantastic? <laughs> and I would like to commend Mal on his terrific staff that have put, organized this event and are helping him put this real first class seamless event together. I would also like to comment, I, you know, to me, seminars are an opportunity to communicate with and train and work with the people that are attending, but also the people back home that either couldn't come or for whatever reason are not here. So the taping, audio and video taping that's going on right now these guys really know their stuff, and I just think they're doing a great job, so I'd like to commend them. But you know, the most important, the most important part of any seminar is not any of, oh, I would also like to commend the wonderful speakers that Mel has attracted to come to this seminar at their expense to present their material. Is that fantastic? <laughs> but the biggest part of any seminar are the attendees. You. You know, you know, in every speaker that's ever been on the stage, including me, the thing that you dream about and that you love to get is a standing ovation. And I would like all of you to stand up right now and give yourselves a standing ovation. How about a second standing ovation? Terrific, thank you. You know, the, the greatest thing about a standing ovation is the people giving it feel b almost as good or better than the guy getting it, you know? So <laughs> that's great. All right, 
I wanted to, some of you are very familiar with my work. You're, you come to me, a lot of people are coming to me during the breaks and say, you know, Ted, I'd like to thank you. Just this morning, at, I was having a coffee at Starbucks and a gentleman came up and he said, you know, I have your book, a golden mailbox, and I'd like to just thank you because that book has made me a lot of money. And that's music to my ears. I love because I love helping entrepreneurs. I love it when my books play a big role in their lives. And some of the best known marketers in the world attribute a lot or even all their success to my work. Uh, very flattering, but of course they deserve the credit because they took the action. So I said to this gentleman, and I'll say to several of, of you are doing seminars, using, recommending my books. I appreciate it. But you know, what you, what you can help some entrepreneur along the way by writing a letter to me because I'm always refreshing the letters of testimonial and I asked several of the people here when they give me these nice comments did you ever send a letter to me about it? they said oh no we know you get a lot of letters I do I'm blessed I have millions of books in circulation I get letters every day but we always like to get more letters so you could do me and particularly new entrepreneurs a real service by writing a letter just with as much detail as you care to share about how those books have helped you. Is that fair? I would appreciate it a lot. And speaking of that, here's one of my books called How to Turn Words into Money, a big bestseller. And I would like to make a present of this book to the individual who has come the furthest to come to this seminar. Now just shout out who people that have come for a long way. I can't, you're all shouting at once, so I can't. Western Australia. <laughs> Mal, Mal, I'm not a very good geographer. I'm not a very good geographer. Where is the furthest? Where? Germany? Where? Bavaria, Russia, you good geographers, where's the furthest that you've heard? Ireland. Is Ireland the furthest? That's the most creative answer that I've ever seen. All the best to you. Uh, you're welcome. And I'd be glad to sign that for you at some time during the event. Okay. I wanted to give you, some of you know my work and some of my background. I'm going to just give you a brief background. Would that help you to know how I started and how I happened to be here? And then I'll get into the material, okay? I was born in the uh, United States in New Jersey. My father was a small uh, business owner, a restaurateur. And by the from the time I was 11, 12, 13 years old, I would hang around the restaurant. And my father was a big believer. He was an immigrant from Greece. And everybody in the family, as soon as they were able, had to work in the restaurant. And I learned a lot from my father because he was extremely good. He was a natural person with customer service. He was very customer conscious. And it just taught me a lot, working in a restaurant, waiting on tables, washing dishes, cooking, and so forth. My father wanted me to, to join me in the family business, but he particularly, his dream for me was to be, an entre to be a uh, pharmacist. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a pharmacist, 
But he wanted me to be a pharmacist because people would call me doctor and I would always have a job. And he was trying to pave the way for me to make my life easier than his was because when he came over, he didn't know the America, he didn't know the English language and it was difficult for him to get started and he worked in the fruit stand and he had a lot of menial jobs, shining shoes and so forth until he started his restaurant. And, but the last thing I ever wanted to do was to stand behind the counter in a pharmacy and mix chemicals for people. It's just not my cup of tea, you know? I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I dreamed of being an entrepreneur. When I would talk about that with my father, he was very discouraging to me. He thought, ah, it's a tough world out there. Uh, I don't think you, you, know, you want to get into that because it's, it's uh, he just tried to discourage me in every way. But I held on to the idea, I wanted to be in my own business, and I wanted to be in the confectionery business because my part of my father's business, he would make confectionery products and it just fascinated me. And I used to help the candy makers and I learned how to make candy and I would assist them in the summertime on weekends and so forth. And when I was about 19 or 20 years old, these gentlemen that owned at that time the largest ad agency in the world at that time was McCann Erickson. They're now part of inner public companies and they wanted a young clerk to work with them. My father's business was a summer resort business at the time and I went to work. I dropped out of college, by the way, I, I forgot that step, but I, I quickly, I, I was in college for a year and I kept on asking my teachers, how can I learn how to be an entrepreneur? You're teaching me how to be an employee and I wanna be an entrepreneur. They said, you gotta get experience and it's the old catch 22. How do you get experience when you don't have the credentials to do anything? And so uh, I got offered this job as a clerk with the McCann Erickson people and it really helped me because I understood a lot about how the general advertising business works. Because at that time, the company was making advertising history, landing accounts like Coca-Cola, Buick. And I would ask Mr. Harper, I was very naive, Mr. Harper, I worked in his office. They liked me because I worked long hours and they, they kind of took a shine to me and they, I would just do errands for them. I would hang around and do errands and do whatever they asked me to do. And I asked Mr. Harper, how do you know Buicks are selling as a result of your advertising? Basic question, right? He said, well, we do surveys. I said, yeah, but you know, Mr. Harper, I'm not an expert on surveys, but you can make surveys say anything you want. Why don't you put in the, yeah, I was very naive. Why don't you put in your ads a coupon so that people that are interested in the new design of the Buick could ask for a brochure about the Buick and you could see how many people responded to the ad in your copy and so forth. And he said, yeah, but there's one problem with that. I said, what's that? He said, the client would know how many people responded to the ad. And I said, well, doesn't the client want to know? Well, yeah, but I mean, said, well, the survey, we, we present surveys to them. I could see very clearly they didn't want to be measured by any objective measurement at all. So I've kind of filed that in the back of my head. And then at age 21, with $800 in savings and $96,000 in debt, I started my first business called Peterson's House of Fudge. And it was a business where we made 77 flavors of fudge, caramels and other products, right before people's eyes. And what I did in that business, I took over a retail proper, a retail store that three people had failed before me. And it was available because nobody wanted it. Everybody figured it was a, a big dark cloud over this building. And I found out who the owner was. His name was Harry Kendall. And I went to him and I said, Mr. Kendall, I'm a young guy, I guess my name is Ted Nicholas. I want to start this business. I want to start a candy business here, but I have no money. But what I will do is I will buy your property with no money down, but I will personally improve the property. 
I'm going to paint it. I'm going to spruce it up. And if I fail, you'll have your property back. It'll be improved. He said, geez, no one's ever approached me with that kind of a deal. I said, well, please think about it over the weekend. I'll come back on Monday. This is Friday. I went back on Monday. He, Mr. Kendall, somehow or other, he took a liking to me and he let me buy the property on that basis. And I'll never forget, the mortgage payment was $308.74 a month. And that's how I started in this place. But I opened the first day in business about two weeks later. And the first day I took in something like $30. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna go bankrupt. Well, I thought if I went bankrupt, I wouldn't lose much because I didn't have anything. <laughs> but, but I didn't wanna go bankrupt. I wanted to do everything possible to succeed. And I thought to myself, there's 25,000 cars passing my location. I've gotta figure out some way to stop those cars without much advertising budget. So I'm reading the paper one day and I see a young, attractive young woman who just won a roller skating contest. So I thought to myself, and most of the people driving by were men, and I thought to myself, <laughs> what, what do, turns men on? Well, I'm thinking two things really, women and cars, and not necessarily in that order, but, <laughs> Women, I knew, I knew they, they liked to look at attractive women. And I went, to, I, met the, I went down to the roller skating rink where she practiced every day. I introduced myself and I said, listen, I've just opened a candy kitchen down the road and I would like you to consider the following proposition. I will dress you in a chef's outfit and put you on a platform in front of outside my candy shop with a big copper kettle and we'll have a seamstress make you a very brief but tasteful <laughs> outfit and you'll stir this copper kettle and we agreed on an hourly rate. Would you do that? And she said, sure. I, I, like, I need the extra money. I said, sure. So she came the next, well, that Saturday when she came out, we had a traffic jam in front of the place. <laughs> and a lot of people stopped and my business really started, and the local newspaper heard about this crazy thing out there, this woman stir, stirring, uh, she was stirring the copper kettle, and they did an article about this new candy shop, and one thing led to another, and the business really started to skyrise, started making money right away the first month. And then I went to the local sign company because it was one of these situations where I wanted to have a series of roadside signs that said, Peterson's House of Fudge, 11 miles away. Peterson's House of Fudge, nine miles away, and so on until you got to the place. And I started putting additions on the road signs, and this is where I started getting interested in words. Words. I started putting different words on the signs, and depending on the words that I put, a greater or lesser number of people stopped. For example, when I use the words, see candy made, three words, see candy made, a lot more people stopped. And then I put the word, the magic words, free samples, and more people stopped. So I began getting very intrigued with words, and I would talk with other businessmen, small businessmen in the area about words, and they didn't seem interested at all. They didn't know anything about it. So then another thing affected me with the words. I created my first brochure about all my candy products. And I put it in each satchel going out of the store. And, and then I created a second catalog and a third. And within a few months, I had several different catalogs. And I described with a copy the confectionery products differently in each catalog. And the results were different. I thought, this is fascinating stuff boy, that's really something. And I couldn't, seem to, I couldn't seem to get any confirmation about was I on a good track or on a bit, but I could just see common sense. In the meantime, I was a, then a great letters to the editor writer. I like writing letters to the editor of newspapers and magazines and seeing my letters printed. And I thought someday I'm going to learn how to make a living using things that I write 
And because these people are publishing things that I write, and, they're, and I'm competing with all these people that are submitting letters to the editor. And so this is like kind of got my real interest, the, the, my hobby of writing letters, and then my business with using words started, I started putting two together.